Wow. So, it's just me? It's just you. Yes, it's this feels so weird. <laughs> Never let me down. 
By, by the way, a little uh, insider knowledge, uh, Cupid was uh, supposed to be Richard Simmons, and then he, he bailed out, uh, he, he didn't show up, and they were like, I was, I was in the other studio at Nickelodeon, and they were like, Tom, can you do kind of a Richard simmons guy? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem, you know? <laughs> Captain America, Iron Man, Colossus, wow, wheelies on there, you got them all. I, I, that, is, that is the beauty of voiceover. Only in voiceover could somebody who looks like me play Captain America. <laughs> and be Tony Stark, too, you know. Uh, so, well, the, the question I had was, uh, sorry, it's going on all the way to but... That's my answer that's going on. Your, your question was very concise. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> so, my question was, uh, what is the most difficult episode of SpongeBob you ever had to do? In all the ten plus years you've been doing it. Oh wow! I mean, uh, I see your favorites are. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, it's almost uh, uh, twenty years because we did the pilot in 1997, you know, and then it's, it's yeah, it went to series in '99. Yeah, in 1999 they greenlit it as a series, and then it's it's kind of always been there. It takes it's never. Uh, it takes these long-ish uh, breaks while they make a movie or something, and then it comes back, you know. And so uh, I would say probably uh, oh, the hardest episode is probably Sailor Mouth. <laughs> You know, that's the one where Spongebob and Patrick learn a word that's uh, written on the back of the wall. And then they just go around throwing it around. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so we were supposed to be recording that. And, you know, swearing without really swearing is hard. Because they would just say ad-lib uh, almost swearing. You know, Spongebob and Patrick ad-lib uh, fake swearing. And then we were like, this is too hard. Could we just really, really cuss, and then you guys just bleep out. <laughs> <laughs> and Clancy Brown, Mr. Grimes, like, I vote for that! You know? <laughs> Listen to the four I know, he makes sense. <laughs> and, uh, so, so that's what we did. So, uh, so that was, uh, so I would say that was a very difficult episode just because of listening to uh, Patrick and uh, Squidward and Mr. Krabs uh, really uh, uh, drop those bombs. Yes. <laughs> Maybe the funniest thing in the world, and also something you will never be allowed to hear. Ever. <laughs> it's it's that. And has that buried in the deep in a pit in the middle of the earth somewhere. Thanks so much for being here to see the lot. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for this. Hi, Liam. Thank you, Liam. I appreciate you. Somebody brings it to my attention, you know what I mean? Often my kids, because I have an 18 year old and a 13 year old. And uh, uh, I know, and, and there's uh, there's all various, uh, there's G rated ones, and then um, <laughs> not so much ones. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I gotta say, they always make me laugh. And, and probably my biggest uh, reaction to it is just, my mind is blown. I, I just feel like it's just really cool to be, again, part of something that has this big pop cultural footprint where people take it, this thing that's there, and then kind of do their own Grandma Moses folk art version of it, you know? <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's pretty cool. I love it. I, I'm always amazed by people's uh, ingenuity and twistedness. Uh, you know, that's always gratifying to see. Yeah, I love the memes. In, in fact, uh, uh, somebody was at my table earlier saying that, they said, for years my friends and I have spoken to each other using nothing but Spongebob memes. <laughs> They come in handy. Somebody's taking too long in the bathroom, you go, two hours in. <laughs> Best of all time is. Flint? 
brain patterns. So, so it's it's it, it's fun. That that that's where it really gets fun. Okay, one more request. I know I'm being like a microphone policy here. But Not as much as me. <laughs> I've got four up here, five. <laughs> four. See, actor, bad math. One, two, three, five. No, no, five! <laughs> Guys, that like the audio book guys, that is a really 
hyper specialized skill. Like it doesn't sound like it, like you'd just be reading out loud, but it's really hard to do, like really time consuming. And people, uh, if you don't do it right, people freak out. You know, like, and authors have their favorite uh, guys that they like, like, like obviously uh, Jim Dale, you know, the, the Harry Potters and all that. Uh, you know, probably the best ever. But uh, uh, I, I wouldn't mind trying it. I wouldn't mind trying it. I'll lock myself in a closet and read you know, War and Peace for a few days. What's the worst that could happen? It would be absolutely perfect. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thanks, man. So I've much. never explored that. But maybe I will. <laughs> I have one question. Sure. What's funnier than 24? Oh. <laughs> 25. <laughs> But so us voiceover actors that get to work, 
you know, pretty often and pretty constantly feel like like we're, we're the luckiest uh, people in Hollywood, you know? Get to do what you do and, and get paid for, for stuff you love. Uh, stuff that got me in trouble in seventh grade, as Rob Paulson says. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. I love it. That's old school. Okay, so I have no idea how to follow that. Um, <laughs> but that was awesome. So, question for you. Mr. Kenny, how about Aria? <laughs> But yeah, I would say Mel Blanc is, is, is it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, have you, well, sorry, like on topic, but quick question. Have you heard about, you know, um, when uh, Mel Blanc went into the coma and everything like that, and the only thing that really stabbed him out of it, the doctor's just like, let me try this. And he's just like, hey, bugs, you in there? And he's just like, yeah, you know, like, yeah. And he just started talking through the characters and everything like that. And yeah. It was also, like, really inspirational. That's pretty that. intense, like, yeah. like it, and it shows how how heavily he identified with those characters or what a part of his DNA and vice versa those were. Yeah, he, he was in a really bad car accident, like, he yeah. ran his, his sports car off Coldwater Canyon or Laurel Canyon in, in L.A. and uh, was in a coma for a long time. And yeah, but when people started talking to him as Bugs, yeah, uh, that, that, that he came out of it, which I can totally see happening with me, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, we hope that. Squidward, you know? <laughs> but, uh, I think uh, uh, definitely 
band beats, you know, Sweet, Sweet Victory is like a brilliant, uh, weird, and that was just, that was just a uh, public domain CD of, that, that, that somebody came across, somebody on the show like just found it, you know, like, like it was, uh, you know, they have these libraries of, of music that you can use that, that uh, you know, their buyouts and composers will just, you know, just a bunch of CDs, action music, horror movie music, you know, power, power ballads, stuff like that, and that was like the generic power ballad that some guy just laid down and like put in this this sound effects stock music <laughs> library. And and somebody heard it, I was talking about one one of the writers, I think it was his service, heard it and just thought it was uh, hilarious. So, <laughs> so it wound up being the end of the the end of the episode, just weird found object uh, art, you know, but uh, and then uh, I remember you for next time. For me, and that's like my favorite, you know, the Marcy the Simon Marcy episode. Super sad, but, but sweet, and, you know. That, I love I love that episode. That, that has actually brought tears to my eyes on Simon and Marcy, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Simon and Marcy is a great episode. Thank you so much. Thanks. What's up, Pinky? Um, can I also go to hug real quick? Uh, all right, sure. I'll come down. I'll come down. All right. I don't... Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you have any like advice for aspiring voice actors? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I told somebody at my table today, don't do it the way I did it, which is just like, you know kind of do stand-up and a whole bunch of other stuff for a zillion years and then somebody sees you at a stand-up club and goes, have you ever thought about doing voiceovers? <laughs> and then you go, yeah. Uh, but uh, that takes a long time. Like, I did, a, I did so much other stuff before I broke into voice acting. You know, I was, I, you know, I was a stand-up and a writer and, you know, did on camera stuff and didn't love any, I, I was glad to not be, uh, I was like, we made a living getting paid to, to do acting and stuff like that and writing, but but I didn't love it the way that I knew I would love voiceover if only somebody would hire me to do voiceover. And um, once I started doing voiceover, it was exactly even more fun and and awesome, and the people were even more entertaining and inspiring that I that I was fantasizing about. Um, but I think. It's really hard. I mean, I, I, I don't have any magic bullet to give anybody. Like, hey, do this, A, B, C, D, and then step E is you have a voiceover career. I think, you know, the, the skills that go into it are, I think, listening. You, you know, you gotta be a good listener. You gotta, you know, uh, 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 build up a repertoire of voices and accents that are really yours and not, and not just copies of, of existing voices, although that can come in handy, too, when the original uh, person, you know. Uh, but, but all, of us, all of us have made, uh, have made the occasional paycheck voicing a character where the original guy has, has moved on, but, but I think what catches people's ears is, is if you audition as, as a voice thing, that, that's something that they weren't expecting. And, you know, to do that, I guess you gotta be in a position where people are hearing your auditions, which, Kind of means you got to go to a place where there's animation, like New York or or L.A. Uh, mostly, you know. Not that you have to start out there, but eventually, I think you know that that that's where you're going to wind up. So if you're not comfortable with uh, with living in L.A. or New York, uh, I think it's it's tough for you. Also, um, I was concerned wearing a striped sweater. When would the best time to do that be? <laughs> You know, the, 
the Ice King actually was one where I got called back in again and again and again where they had a couple of guys that, that they liked and, and you know, I, I think I do okay and then you, you get called back in and have to read it again and you're going, should I do something different or are they like, you know, you're, you're trying to second guess, you're going, I think Pendleton Ward seems to like what I'm doing, but who needs to be, is, is it the network that needs convincing or does he need a little tweak that he's not hearing and, and isn't really uh, clearly conveying to me as the actor or whatever. Like, so I would say the Ice King was, was, a, was a pretty hard one to land. Oh. Yeah, and then uh, the Penguin on um, the Batman, the series, the Batman, uh, the, the Oswald Cobblepot Penguin, not, not, not the Gunther Penguin, <laughs> uh, was, uh, was a tough one to land too because they, they didn't want anything that sounded like Burgess Meredith in the 60s series. And then I just kept going and, and doing kind of Burgess Meredith. <laughs> and they're going, that's kind of cool. Whatever you're doing, we like it. It's like, exactly what you're telling me not to do, but I'm not saying that a lot. But there's something interesting here. It's good because Burgess Meredith in 1966. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta outsmart these people. But, but yeah, the, the Ice King casting went on for a while. And I was so glad. And in the original, it's John Casier, the Crypt Keeper, uh, was uh, the voice of the Ice King in the original Internet short where they go to Mars and meet Lincoln and stuff like that. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I was glad to land that one eventually. But it, yeah, it took, I had that fish on the line for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. And, and by the way, quite often it, it gets down to that and they go, yeah, they're not going with you. And you just go, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> that's, that's part of the game. Uh, along with all the fun and, and uh, creativity of the voice acting thing, you gotta have a pretty thick uh, rhino skin for rejection and stuff that you really want to work on that you don't get to work on. And then there's a lot of stuff that you do get to work on. So, cool. you know. Thank you so much. You bet. Sure. Seven, eight more minutes. Cool. Hi. Hi. What's your name? I'm Zach. Zach? Yeah. Hi, Zach. Hi. Um, fools can have a hug. Oh, come on, Zach. Oh, all right, come on. I'm going to make you come to me because you're young. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. All right. Hey. 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 Nice to meet you. My daughter just turned 13 two days ago. Good to see you, baby. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, what is your favorite pet? Gary, Google, or Patrick? Ooh. <laughs> Gary, Gooder, or Patrick? Wow. Does Patrick qualify as a pet? <laughs> Does that mean that my, any of my neighbors in Studio City could be my pet? <laughs> that is so cool. Wow. So well, wow. so the guy from Fallout Boy, Patrick Stump, lives across the street from me. I guess he could be my pet. <laughs> so I could have a pet named Patrick. That's cool. <laughs> Gunner Streaky Man when he turns into the uh horror. Yeah. 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 Freaks me out. <laughs> um also I have a favorite to ask you. Could you shout out to my sixth grade English teacher, Mr. Coney? He loves my love. Cool. Your sixth grade what? English teacher, Mr. Coney. Mr. Coney. Colin? Coney. Coney? Coney. 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 Got it. So it's Kearney. It's like my name, Kenny, but with an R. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Now I get it. I'm sorry I'm so deaf, man. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Am I shouting out? Yes. I am shouting out to all the smart fish in Mr. Kearney's class. Mr. Kearney, thanks for doing what you do. Bye. Uh, 
that sponge out of water and, the, and what I call the David Hasselhoff one <laughs> were like 11 years apart, which is a really long time in between. I think only Dumb and Dumber uh, has that beat, you know? But uh, it was funny, in 2004, like, like the social media aspect of things like wasn't nearly what it was in 2015. And uh, also, SpongeBob wasn't nearly as much of a global icon in, in 2004, because the show just started in 1999. So by the time that, that last movie, Sponge Out of Water, happened in 2015, SpongeBob as a, a property and as a character was in so many more uh, corners of the globe than it had been in, in 2004. Like, 2004 felt like a big deal, and then like, you know, when we did Sponge Out of Water, it was just like, it seemed like SpongeBob awareness was just so much more global, you know, and the coverage of the movie and the interviews that we were doing were literally all over the planet Earth. And, you know, all the cast members were the same, so we were just looking at each other going, this is, this is like a totally different epoch in, in you know, of everything. So yeah, that, that was probably the main, uh, the, the main difference was SpongeBob was, was so much more even bigger in 2015 than he was in 2004. Like he was still kind of somewhat, a little bit new in 2004, you know, to, to a lot of countries. Thank you very much. You got it. Thank you. All right, of course, let's see the last question. Then we've got to scoot Tom down for professional photos at 3.30. Is that what's happening? That's what's happening. Okay. And then, Hi. I wanted to know what do you think is the most important role you ever did for your career or as an influence or whatever? Wow, that's really good. <laughs> the most important role of, of like that, that like was seminal to my career? Sure. That's pretty good. I, you know, there's a bunch of, I mean, you know, really it's not so much roles <laughs> as people that, that were really important to my career. Like when, when you look back and you see the timeline of, of, of your work life over the years, like when I was 16 years old, uh, I answered an ad in the local like uh, giveaway paper to to, to do a stand-up comedy night in Syracuse, New York, in my hometown. And that, that ad was taken up by a guy named Barry Crimmins, who uh, Bobcat Goldwing just did an amazing documentary about called Call Me Lucky. Uh, you should look it up, you can watch it for free online. This guy, Barry Crimmins, who's our hometown of Syracuse, was the first guy to ever hire me and Bobcat to do stand-up and give us 20 bucks and go, hey, you kids are funny, you know? And then he had this other amazing life where since he had been uh, preyed upon as a kid, uh, he, in the early days of, of the internet, he became uh, a, a very early, early activist warrior against uh, uh, child victimization on the internet. Like before, before the FBI didn't even really have computers yet, and he was going, "Hey, this is going on." You know, he's so he's this amazing uh, person in my life. Like he's one. Joe Murray, the creator of Rocko's Modern Life, gave me a shot. When, you know, when I'd never done a show before. Uh, Gany Tarkovsky, Craig McCracken, you know, uh, Pendleton Ward, Steve Hillenberg, you know, SpongeBob creator, and, and, you know, just people that took a chance on you and go, yeah, that guy, I think he brings something to the party. Um, you know, those, each one of those has helped uh, keep me working for all these years, you know, and, and so, so it's not so much iconic roles for me as, as iconic people in my life that have, uh, have been supportive of me. You bet, baby.